properties of exponential functions. Now we want to learn about these, so let's review our transformations. So if I had a parent function y equals x squared, what would these three functions do to that parent? So quick refresher, pause, check out those first three. Review those transformations. Let's try to identify transformations on exponential functions. It's important to note the parent function for an exponential is y equals b to the x. So we have a base to that power of x. So when we're identifying transformations for this first problem, we need to first figure out what the parent function is, and then we can state the transformations. So we have y equals 3 to the 2x power. So parent function, 2 to the x, base to the power of x, y equals 2 to the x for my parent. Now it's being multiplied by a factor of 3. Okay, factor, I'm thinking vertical stretch by a factor of 3. Looking at the next one, weird. Well, we do have a base of 7, so 7 to the x is going to be my parent function. Now let's take a closer look. We have a negative inside with the x, and then we have plus 2. Okay, that negative's inside, so inside we think vertical reflection. What's that plus 2 outside the 7 to the negative x going to do? It's outside. Outside, same. We know it's a translation up two units. All right, we know these. Go try three. Let's stick together on four. What would that parent function be? Well, it looks like that base is negative two, but we know that just two is being taken to that power, so that negative is separate and part of the transformations. That means that y equals two to the x is my parent function, so now we have a ton of transformations to identify. Well, we know that negative out in front is just a reflection about the x-axis, but what do you think about that plus three up with that x in the exponent? It's like it's inside with the x, so inside opposite, so it's going to be a translation to the left three units. Minus 5, we just know that's translated down 5. All right, we're pros. Go do those last two, 5 and 6. Okay, now it's time to find the y-intercept. We already know how to do that too. Plug in zero for x. First function, let's just pop a zero in for that x three times two to the zero power. Evaluate two to the zero. Anything to the zero is one. Three times one is three. We're not just gonna write y equals three though, right? No, we're gonna write zero, three, coordinate. Let's try number two. Pop in that zero for the x. Seven to the zero is one. One plus two is 3. Y-intercept is 0, 3. Getting the hang of this? Why don't you try the rest? Were you able to find all those y-intercepts? I know it was a tight squeeze, but we got them, right? Check out 5. Did you catch that? It ended up being 2 to the negative 4. Well, we know that that's just 1 over 2 to the 4th, right? So 1 over 16. Why don't we take a break from that? Notice that we have this function, y equals 1 plus 1 over x, all raised to the x. Well, let's find out what happens as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger. What do you think will happen with y? Is it going to get ginormous? All right, let's go through the directions. If you have a calculator handy, grab it. Let's do this. So first, in the y equals menu, let's type that function in. Next, we're going to ask it to evaluate different values of x. So I'm going to hit the second button and then window. That gets me to table set right above it. There, I'm going to arrow down and make the independent variable on ask. So you have to use the arrows, arrow over, and then hit enter so that it's on ask. Now we're ready to evaluate and find out what happens when our x values get larger and larger. Okay. So hit second, graph, and let's type in zero. Error, what happened? Well, look at the function again. Hmm, one divided by x, one divided by zero. Thou shalt not divide by zero. All right, of course we get an error there. Whew, okay, that had me scared for a second. Let's type in one now. What about 10? A thousand. Are you kind of surprised? Are the outputs getting larger and larger and larger? Not really. What happens when you put in 10,000 or 100,000? We could even put in a million or more. But wait, 
You may not want to because otherwise your calculator is going to be sitting there calculating for a while. So just pause. What do you think is going to happen here? Is it getting larger and larger and larger? Are we ever hitting three? No, we're never going to. So let's go ahead and arrow over to the Y coordinate and that way we can see more digits. As we go along, we see that it's just really going 2.71, 2.718 and so on. Well, guess what? We've just discovered E. 2.71828 and it goes on and on and on forever without repeating because it's irrational. Just like pi is irrational, square root 2 is irrational, it's a never-ending, non-repeating decimal. You know what's even more amazing? They first started noticing this back in 1618. And then Bernoulli got a hold of it and introduced it as a constant. For a while, it was known as B for Bernoulli. However, it didn't stick. Euler got a hold of it, and now we do recognize E as the irrational number 2.71828 and on forever. If you want to find something really cool, research the Bernoulli principle. We use it for flight. Okay, let's make sure we have this straight. E is an irrational number like pi or square root of 2, and E is also known as the natural base. So now when we see E, we have to be careful. Are we using it as a variable or are we using it as the number 2.718 and so on? Let's evaluate using E. So the first one is E cubed. Obviously, we're going to pull out our calculators. So E cubed is approximately 20.086, and then of course we figured out the others. Let's review what we've learned so far. We know that these exponential functions take the form of y equals a times b to the x power. That's an exponential equation. We also know that b is the growth or decay factor. So that means that b can be written as 1 plus r, where r is the rate of increase in decimal form, for growth, or 1 minus r, where r is the rate of decrease in decimal form. So the basic forms of both of these functions could be a of t equals a, that's the initial amount, times 1 plus r to the t for growth, and then a times 1 minus r to the t for decay. Let's use these forms to solve some problems. If I deposit $10,000 into a mutual fund that earns 6%, annual interest, what will the value be in 15 years? There were some important values there. One, I'm depositing $10,000. So that's my initial amount. Also, I have a 6% annual increase. So it's earning, so that means it's appreciating. So this is growth. And I want to know the value after 15 years. We always, always want to start these with a model first. So I'm just going to write a general model. A of t equals, okay, 10,000 is my initial times one plus, am I gonna write six for 6%? Because that's my rate, right? No, I'm gonna write it in decimal form. Move that decimal place twice, so 0 0.06 to the T. There's my model. Now I wanna know how much money's gonna be in this account after 15 years. What do we do? Plug in 15. Calculator time, let's plug this in. After 15 years, the account balance is $23,965. Now, looking at the cents here, the bank's not going to give me a single penny more than it's earned. So, 58 cents. Let's try another. The population of an endangered species is currently 27,000, but is decreasing at a rate of 12% per year. If the decline continues at this rate, how many of the species will remain after six years. I heard decrease in there, so I know I'm gonna need to use a decay model. This is population, so let's use P of T. I know the initial population is 27,000, and then I'm gonna do my one minus R, because this is decay, so one minus, okay, my rate, it's not 12, it's 0.12 to the T power. Always write your model first. Then I'm trying to figure out what the population is after six years, so I can plug in six. So after six years, the population has declined to about 12,538. 
I'm not gonna include those decimals, right? Because we can't have 0.91 of a species. Continuously compounded interest. We have an equation, a of t equals p times e raised to the rt. What's our a stand for? Well, that's the amount in the account at time t. p is gonna be the principal or the initial amount. So can you really see that we're talking about an exponential equation still? What is our base? The base is e. E, of course, is not a variable. That's our number, 2.71828, etc. All right, what about R? Well, R is the interest rate in decimal form always for equations. And T is our time in years for this problem. Let's use our formula. So we want to find the amount in an account that's continuously compounded given the following conditions. Our principal is 3,000. We have an annual interest rate of 5% and we're going to keep it there for four years. All right, so once again, let's just write this out. A equals P E to the art. Well, shoot, that's the almost parent formula. We'll never forget that. So A equals our principal of $3,000 times the number E raised to the interest rate, which is 5%, so 0 0.05. I'm gonna put this in parentheses because that 0 0.05 gets multiplied by the number of years, which is four years. Okay, be careful there with that exponent. So 3,000 was the principal, E is our number, and it's raised to the 0 0.05 times four. So when we plug that in the calculator, be very careful, put that in parentheses. So after four years, it looks like my account has earned another $664.20. So I have a total account balance of $3,664.20. Now, did you notice that if we rounded and did correct rounding, this would have rounded up to 21 cents. However, do you think the bank is going to give me that extra little portion of the penny? Probably not. Okay, remember, anytime you see the words continuously compounded, it has to have the word continuous in there, you use the almost pure formula.